being established in that position, and having deliberately resolved to make himself prince and to seize by violence, without obligation to others, that which had been conceded to him by assent, one morning he assembled the people and the senate of Syracuse, as if he had to discuss with them things relating to the republic, and at a given signal the soldiers killed all the senators, and, the, and although he was twice routed by the Carthaginians, and ultimately besieged, yet not only was he able to defend his city, but leaving part of his men for its defense, with the others, the Carthaginians reduced to extreme necessity, were compelled to come to terms with Agathocles, and leaving Sicily to him, had to be content with the possession of Africa. One Agathocles the Sicilian, born 361 B.C., died 289 B.C., therefore, he who considers the actions and the genius of this man will see nothing, or little, which can be attributed to fortune, inasmuch as he attained preeminence. Yet it cannot be called talent to slay fellow citizens, to deceive friends, to be without faith, without mercy, without religion. Such methods may gain impossible. Still, if the courage of Agathocles in entering into and extricating himself from dangers be considered, together with his greatness of mind in enduring and overcoming hardships, it can, nevertheless, his barbarous cruelty and inhumanity with infinite wickedness do not permit him to be celebrated among the most excellent men. What he achieved cannot be attributed either to fortune or genius. In our times, during the rule of Alexander VI, a Liverato de Fermo, having been left an orphan many years before, was brought up by his maternal uncle, Giovanni Fog. After Pagolo died, he fought under his brother Vitellozo, and in a very short time, being endowed with wit and a vigorous body and mind, he became the first man, but it appearing a paltry thing to serve under others. He resolved, with the aid of some citizens of Fermo, to whom the slavery of their country was dearer than its liberty, and with so he wrote to Giovanni Fogli and he, having been away from home for many years, he wished to visit him and his city and in some measure to look upon his pay. Giovanni, therefore, did not fail in any attentions due to his nephew, and he caused him to be honorably received by the Fermians, and he lodged him in his own house, where, having when the viands and all the other entertainments that are usual in such banquets were finished, a liberato artfully began certain grave discourses, speaking of the greatness of Pope Alexander, no sooner were they seated than soldiers issued from secret places and slaughtered Giovanni and the rest. After these murders, a Liverato, mounted on horseback, rode up and down the town and besieged the chief magistrate in the palace, so that in fear the people were forced to obey him. He killed all the malcontents who were able to injure him, and strengthened himself with new civil and military ordinances, in such a way that, in the year during which he held the principality, and his destruction would have been as difficult as that of Agathocles if he had not allowed himself to be overreached by Caesar Borgia, who took him with the Orsini and Vitelli at Sinigalia. Thus one year after he had committed this parricide, he was strangled, together with Vitellozo, whom he had made his leader in valor and wickedness. Some may wonder how it can happen that Agathocles, and his like, after infinite treacheries and cruelties, should live for long secure in his country, and defend himself from it. I believe that this follows from severity stew being badly or properly used. Those may be called properly used, if of evil it is possible to speak well, that are applied at one blow and are necessary to one's security, and that are not persisted in afterward. The badly employed are those which, notwithstanding they may be few in the commencement, multiply with time rather than decrease. Those who practice the first system are able, by aid of God or man, to mitigate in some degree their rule, as Agathocles did. It is impossible for those who follow the other to maintain themselves. Tumor Bird suggests that this word probably comes near the modern equivalent of Machiavelli's thought when he speaks of crudelta than the more obvious cruelties. Hence it is to be remarked that he who does otherwise, either from timidity or evil advice, 
is always compelled to keep the knife in his hand. Neither can he rely on his subjects, nor can they attach themselves, for injuries ought to be done all at one time, so that, being tasted less, they offend less. Benefits ought to be given little by little, so that the flavor of them, and above all things, a prince ought to live amongst his people in such a way that no unexpected circumstances, whether of good or evil, shall make him change. Because if the necessity... Chapter X. Concerning a civil principality, but coming to the other point, where a leading citizen becomes the prince of his country, not by wickedness or any intolerable violence, but by the favor of his fellow citizens, I say then that such a principality is obtained either by the favor of the people or by the favor of the nobles, because in all cities these two distinct parties are found, and from this it arises that the people do not wish to be ruled nor oppressed by the nobles, and the nobles wish to rule and oppress the people. A principality is created either by the people or by the nobles accordingly as one or other of them has the opportunity, for the nobles, seeing they cannot withstand the people, begin to cry up the people. Finding they cannot resist the nobles, also cry up the reputation of one of themselves, and make him a prince so as to be defended by his authority. He who obtains sovereignty by the assistance of the nobles maintains himself with more difficulty than he who comes to it by the aid of the people, because the former finds himself with many around him, who, but he who reaches sovereignty by popular favor finds himself alone, and has none around him, or few, who are not prepared to obey him. Besides this, one cannot by fair dealing, and without injury to others, satisfy the nobles, but you can satisfy the people, for their object is more righteous than that of the nobles. It is to be added also that a prince can never secure himself against a hostile people because of there being too many, whilst from the nobles he can secure himself, as they are few in number. The worst that a prince may expect from a hostile people is to be abandoned by them, but from hostile nobles he has not only to fear abandonment, but also that they will rise against him. Further, the prince is compelled to live always with the same people, but he can do well without the same nobles, being able to make and unmake them daily, and to give or take away authority when... Therefore, to make this point clearer, I say that the nobles ought to be looked at mainly in two ways. That is to say, they either shape their course in such a way as binds them entirely. Those who so bind themselves and are not rapacious ought to be honored and loved. Or those who do not bind themselves may be dealt with into one. But when for their own ambitious ends they shun binding themselves, it is a token that they are giving more thought to themselves than to you and a prince ought to guard against such, and to fear them, and therefore, one who becomes a prince through the favor of the people ought to keep them friendly, and this he can easily do, seeing they only ask not to be oppressed by him. But one who, in opposition to the people, becomes a prince by the favor of the nobles, ought, above everything, to seek to win the people over to himself, and this he may easily do, because men, when they receive good from him of whom they were expecting evil, are bound more closely to their benefactor. Thus the people quickly become more devoted to him than if he had been raised to Nabus, one prince of the Spartans, sustained the attack of all Greece, and of a victorious Roman army, and against them he defended his country and his government, and for the over- and not let any one impong this statement with the trite proverb that he who builds on the people builds on the mud, for this is true when a private citizen makes a foundation there, and persuades himself. But granted a prince who has established himself as above, who can command, and is a man of courage, undismayed in adversity, who does not fail in other qualifications, and who, one Nabus, tyrant of Sparta, conquered by the Romans under Flamininus in 195 B.C., killed 192 B.C., to Messer Giorgio Scali. This event is to be found in Machiavelli's Florentine History, Book IA. These principalities are liable to danger when they are passing from the civil to the absolute order of government, for such princes either rule personally or through magistrates. In the latter case their government is weaker and more insecure, 
because it rests entirely on the goodwill of those citizens who are raised to the magistracy, and who, especially in trouble, for such a prince cannot rely upon what he observes in quiet times, when citizens have need of the state, because then every one agrees with him, they all promise, and when death is, and so much the more is this experiment dangerous, inasmuch as it can only be tried once. Therefore a wise prince ought to adopt such a course that his citizens will always in every sort and kind of circumstance have need of the state and of him, and then he will always find them faithful. Chapter Xuri Concerning the way in which the strength of all principalities ought to be measured, it is necessary to consider another point in examining the character of these principalities. That is, whether a prince... And, to make this quite clear, I say that I consider those who are able to support themselves by their own resources, who can, either by abundance of man or money, raise a sufficient army to join battle against... The first case has been discussed, but we will speak of it again should it recur. In the second case, one can say nothing except to encourage such princes to provision and fortify their towns, and not on any account to defend the country. And whoever shall fortify his town well, and shall have managed the other concerns of his subjects in the way stated above, and to be often repeated, will never be attacked without great caution. The cities of Germany are absolutely free, they own but little country around them and they yield obedience to the emperor when it suits them, nor do they fear this or any other power they may have near them, and beyond this, to keep the people quiet and without loss to the state, they always have the means of giving work to the community in those labors that are the life and strength of the city, and on the therefore, a prince who has a strong city, and had not made himself odious, will not be attacked, or if any one should attack he will only be driven off with disgrace. Again, and whoever should replay. If the people have property outside the city and see it burnt, they will not remain patient, and the long siege and self interest will make them forget their. Further, the enemy would naturally on his arrival at once burn and ruin the country at the time when the spirits of the people are still hot and ready for the defense, and therefore so much the less, for it is the nature of men to be bound by the benefits they confer as much as by those they receive. Therefore, if everything is well considered, it will not be difficult for a wise prince to keep the minds of his citizens steadfast from first to last, when he does not fail to support and defend. Chapter Xi. Concerning ecclesiastical principalities, it only remains now to speak of ecclesiastical principalities, touching which all difficulties are prior to getting possession, because they are acquired. These princes alone have states and do not defend them, and they have subjects and do not rule them, and the states, although unguarded, are not taken from them, and the subjects, although not, such principalities only are secure and happy, but being upheld by powers, to which the human mind cannot reach, I shall speak no more of them, because being exalted and maintained by God, it would be the act of a presumptuous. Nevertheless, if any one should ask of me how comes it that the Church has attained such greatness in temporal power, seeing that from Alexander backwards the Italian potentates, not only those before Charles, King of France, passed into Italy, one this country was under the dominion of the Pope, the Venetians, the King of Naples, the Duke of Milan, and the Florentines. These potentates had two principal anxieties. The one, that no foreigner should enter Italy under arms. The other, that none of themselves should seize more territory. Those about whom there was the most anxiety were the Pope and the Venetians. To restrain the Venetians the union of all the others was necessary, as it was for the defense of Ferra, and to keep down the Pope they made use of the barons of Rome, who being divided into two and although there might arise sometimes a courageous pope, such as Sixtus, yet neither fortune nor wisdom could rid him of these annoyances. And the short life of a pope is also a cause of weakness. For in the ten years, which is the average life of a pope, he can with difficulty lower one of the factions. And if so, to this was the reason why the temporal powers of the pope were little esteemed in Italy. One Charles Villa invaded Italy in 1494. Alexander the Sixth arose afterwards, 
who of all the pontiffs that have ever been showed how a pope with both money and arms was able to prevail, and through the instrumentality of the Duke Valent, and although his intention was not to aggrandize the church, but the Duke, nevertheless, what he did contributed to the greatness of the church, which after his death and the ruin of the Duke, became the heir. Pope Julius came afterwards and found the church strong, possessing all the Romagna, the barons of Rome reduced to impotence and through the chastisements of alexander such things julius not only followed but improved upon and he intended to gain bologna to ruin the venetians and to drive the french out of italy all of these enterprises prospered with him and so much the more to his credit inasmuch as he did everything to strengthen the church and not any private person he kept also the orsini and Colonnesi factions within the bounds in which he found them and although there was among them some mind to make disturbance, nevertheless he held two things firm. The for whenever these factions have their cardinals they do not remain quiet for long, because cardinals foster the factions in Rome and out of it, and the barons are compelled to support them, and thus from the ambi For these reasons his holiness Pope Leodou found the pontificate most powerful, and it is to be hoped that, if others made it great in arms, he will make it still greater and more venerated by two Pope Leo was the Cardinal de Medici. Chapter Xi. How many kinds of soldiery there are, and concerning mercenaries having discoursed particularly on the characteristics of such principalities as in the beginning I proposed to discuss, and having we have seen above how necessary it is for a prince to have his foundations well laid, otherwise it follows of necessity he will go to ruin. The chief foundations of all states, new as well as old or composite, are good laws and good arms, and as there cannot be good laws where the state is not well armed, I shall leave the laws out of the discussion and shall speak of the arms. I say, therefore, that the arms with which a prince defends his state are either his own, or they are mercenaries, auxiliaries, or mixed mercenaries and auxiliaries are useless and dangerous and if one holds his state based on these arms he will stand neither firm nor safe for they are disunited and the fact is they have no other attraction or reason for keeping the field than a trifle of stipend which is not sufficient to make them willing to die for you they are ready enough to be your soldiers whilst you do not make war but if war comes they take themselves off or run from the foe which I should have little trouble to prove, for the ruin of Italy has been... Thus it was that Charles, King of France, was allowed to seize Italy with chalk in hand one, and he who told us that our sins were the cause of it told the truth, but they were not the sins he imagined. And, as they were the sins of princes, it is the princes who have also suffered the penalty. One with chalk in hand, called Gesso. This is one of the bonds mots of Alexander Vi, and refers to the ease with which the Vives uh, seized Italy. The history of Henry Vi, by Lord Bacon, King Charles had conquered the realm of Naples, and lost it again, in a kind of a felicity of a dream. He passed the whole length of Italy without resistance, so that it was true what Pope Alexander was wont to say, that the Frenchmen came into Italy with chalk in their hands, the mercenary captains are either capable men or they are not. If they are, you cannot trust them, because they always aspire to their own greatness, either by oppressing you, who are their master, and if it be urged that whoever is armed will act in the same way, whether mercenary or not, I reply that when arms have to be resorted to, either by a prince or a republic, then the prince ought to go, and experience has shown princes and republics, single-handed, making the greatest progress, and mercenaries doing nothing except damage. And it is more difficult to bring a re Rome and Sparta stood for many ages armed and free. The Switzers are completely armed and quite free. Of ancient mercenaries, for example, there are the Carthaginians, who were oppressed by their mercenary soldiers after the first war with the Romans, although the Carthaginians had their own. After the death of Epaminondas, Philip of Maston was made captain of their soldiers by the Thebans, and after victory he took away their liberty. Duke Philippo being dead, 
the Molinese enlisted Francisco Sforza against the Venetians, and he, having overcome the enemy at Caravaggio too, allied himself with them to crush the Mol. His father, Sforza, having been engaged by Queen Johanna III of Naples, left her unprotected, so that she was forced to throw herself into the arms of the King of Aragon, in order to and if the Venetians and Florentines formerly extended their dominions by these arms, and yet their captains did not make themselves princes, but have defended them, I reply that the Florentines, one who did not conquer was Giovanni Acute of Four, and since he did not conquer his fidelity cannot be proved, but every one will acknowledge that had he conquered, the Florentines would have stood at his death. Sforza had the Braxestri always against him, so they watched each other. Francisco turned his ambition to Lombardy, Braxio against the church and the kingdom of Naples. But let us come to that which happened a short while ago. The Florentines appointed as their captain Pagolo Vitelli, a most prudent man, who from a private position had risen to the greatest renown. If this man had taken Pisa, nobody can deny that it would have been proper for the Florentines to keep in with him for if he became the soldier of their enemies they had no means of resisting, and if they had the Venetians, if their achievements are considered, will be seen to have acted safely and gloriously so long as they sent to war their own men, when with armed gentlemen and pl This was before they turned to enterprises on land, but when they began to fight on land they forsook this virtue and followed the custom of Italy. And in the beginning of their expansion on land, through not having much territory, and because of their great reputation, they had not much to fear from their captains. But when they expanded, they had afterwards for their captains Bartolomeo de Bergamo, Roberto de San Severino, the Count of Patigliano Six, and the like, under whom they had to dread loss and not gain, because from such arms conquests come but slowly, long delayed and inconsiderable, but the loss is sudden and portentous. 2 Battle of Caravaggio, 15 September 1448. 3 Johanna II of Naples, the widow of Ladislao, King of Naples. 4 Giovanni Acuto, an English knight whose name was Sir John Hawkward. He fought in the English wars in France, and was knighted by Edward I.A. Afterwards he collected a body of troops and went into Italy. These became the famous White Company. He took part in many wars, and died in Florence in 1394. He was born about 1320 at Seibel Hedingham, a village in Essex. He married Domnia, a daughter of Bernabo Visconti. 5. Carmignuola. Francisco Busson, born at Carmignola about 1390, executed at Venice, 5th May 1432. 6. Bartolomeo Caglioni of Bergamo died 1457. Robert II of San Severino died fighting for Venice against Sigismund, Duke of Austria, in 1487. Promo Capitano in Italia Machiavelli, Count of Pitigliano, Niccolo Orsini, born 1442, died 1510. Seven Battle of Vela in 1509. And as with these examples I have reached Italy, which has been ruled for many years by mercenaries, I wish to discuss them more seriously, in order that, having seen their rise and pr you must understand that the empire has recently come to be repudiated in Italy, that the Pope has acquired more temporal power, and that Italy has been divided up into more states, for the reason from this it came to pass that Italy fell partly into the hands of the Church and of republics, and, the church consisting of priests, and the republic of citizens unaccustomed to arms. The first who gave renown to this soldiery was Alberigo de Conio VIII the Romagnian. From the school of this man sprang, among others, Braxio and Sforza, who in their time were the arbiters of Italy. After these came all the other captains who till now have directed the arms of Italy, and the end of all their valor has been, that she has been overrun by Charles, Robbed by Louis, the principle that has guided them has been, first, to lower the credit of infantry so that they might increase their own. They did this because, subsisting on their pay and without territory, they were unable to support many soldiers, and a few infantry did not give them any authority. 
so they were led to employ cap. They had, besides this, used every art to lessen fatigue and danger to themselves and their soldiers, not killing in the fray, but taking prisoners and liberating without ransom. They did not attack towns at night, nor did the garrisons of the towns attack encampments at night. They did not surround the camp either with stockade or ditch, nor did they campaign in the winter. All these things were permitted by their military rules, and devised by them to avoid, as I have said, both fatigue and dangers. Thus they have brought Italy to slavery and ate Alberigo de Conio, Alberico de Barbiano, Count of Cuneo in Romagna. He was the leader of the famous company of George, composed entirely of Italian soldiers. He died in 1409. Chapter Xia. Concerning auxiliaries, mixed soldiery, and one's own auxiliaries, which are the other useless arm, are employed when a prince is called in with his forces to aid and defend. These arms may be useful and good in themselves, but for him who calls them in they are always disadvantageous. For losing, one is undone, and winning, one, one Ferdinand V. F. I. of Aragon and Sicily, F. I. A. of Naples, surnamed the Catholic, born 1452, died 1516. And although ancient histories may be full of examples, I do not wish to leave this recent one of Pope Julius II, the peril of which cannot fail to be perceived, for he wishing to get but his good fortune brought about a third event, so that he did not reap the fruit of his rash choice, because, having his auxiliaries routed at Ravenna, and the Switzers having risen, the Florentines, being entirely without arms, sent ten thousand Frenchmen to take Pisa, whereby they ran more danger than at any other time of their troubles. The Emperor of Constantinople, too, to oppose his neighbors, sent ten thousand Turks into Greece, who, on the war being finished, were not willing to quit. This was the beginning of the Sir Two Joans Cantacuzinus, born 1300, died 1383. Therefore, let him who has no desire to conquer make use of these arms, for they are much more hazardous than mercenaries, because with them the ruin is ready made, they are all united. In conclusion, in mercenaries dastardy is most dangerous. In auxiliaries, valor. The wise prince, therefore, has always avoided these arms and turned to his own, and has been willing rather to lose with them than to conquer with the others, not deeming that a real... I shall never hesitate to cite Caesar Borgia and his actions. This duke entered the Romagna with auxiliaries, taking their only French soldiers, and with them he captured Amala and Forla, but afterwards, such forces not appearing and the difference between one and the other of these forces can easily be seen when one considers the difference there was in the reputation of the duke, when he had the French, when he had the Orsini and Vitelli. I was not intending to go beyond Italian and recent examples, but I am unwilling to leave out Hiero, the Syracusan, he being one of those I have named above. This man, as I have said, made head of the army by the Syracusans, soon found out that a mercenary soldiery, constituted like our Italian condottieri, was of no... I wish also to recall to memory an instance from the Old Testament applicable to this subject. David offered himself to Saul to fight with Goliath, the Philistine champion, and, to give him courage, Saul armed him with his own weapons, which David rejected as soon... In conclusion... The arms of others either fall from your back, or they weigh you down, or they bind you fast. Charles the Seventh, three, the father of King Louis the Eleventh, four, having by good fortune and valor liberated France from the English, recognized the necessity of being armed with forces of his own. Afterwards, his son King Louis abolished the infantry and began to enlist the Switzers, which mistake followed by others, as, as is now seen a source of peril to that kingdom. Hence it arises that the French cannot stand against the Switzers, and without the Switzers they do not come off well against others. The armies of the French have thus become mixed, partly mercenary and partly national, both of which arms together are much better than mercenaries alone or auxiliaries alone, 
but much and this example proves it for the kingdom of france would be unconquerable if the ordinance of charles had been enlarged or maintained